Okay, we are live here, and I like to just take a minute when we start to make sure the audio is working okay, uh, that you guys can see my video okay. I'm doing this as a YouTube Live, but I've also got Facebook Live going, so I hope that is working for everybody. Um, okay, I got a thumbs up, so I'm going to go with that. So today we are doing a tasting on rosé wine. If you didn't get my email and you didn't know or if you forgot and you got my email and you forgot, um, make sure you chill your wine. Uh, some people are always confused about whether or not to chill rosé wine. So if you haven't done that already, I'm going to you know, do a little intro and stuff like that. So you can right now do a little trick that I have, which is I take a um, wet paper towel. I wet it or you could take a dish towel or something like that. Wrap your bottle in it and stick it in the freezer. And I have to credit my brother for teaching me that trick. Uh, it's a really good one. And it's actually the fastest way to chill a bottle of wine. I'm a huge fan of it. So go ahead, do that now. Also take out your wine glasses if you don't already have those ready. And you want your wine glasses to be um, clean, obviously. And I don't use a lot of dish soap on mine or I use neutral smelling dish soap. So that when you have your wine glasses, you actually smell and taste the wine. You don't smell the dish detergent, the soap or whatever it is you're using on your glasses. Um, and for wine tasting, I really love to have one glass per wine I'm tasting. So right now I have, well, let's see if I can pick up all three. I've got my three wine glasses ready to pour all of my wines in. If you have folks tasting with you, and I know Martha, um, oh, Sam asks, how long do we keep it in the freezer? That's a really good question. Um, you don't have to keep it in the freezer for that long. You can really just keep it in there for 10 to 15 minutes and it'll chill the wine properly. But um, I will admit that there have been times when I've accidentally frozen the wine. And so what happens then is the ice expands and it'll kind of start to push the cork up. Um, and that'll happen if you've left it in for like an hour or something like that. So when you stick it in the freezer, set the timer, set the timer for like 15 minutes so that you remember to take the wine out of the freezer. <laughs> Thanks for asking that. Um, so you've got a wine glass for each wine. If you're the type of person you're tasting with other people, I think Martha's got uh, a bunch of friends over at her house that are all tasting with her. So obviously you might not have three wine glasses per person. So what you can do is have one wine glass per person, but pour just what I would call a tasting size pour of the wine, which is about two ounces, I'd say. Um, and this will allow you to taste the wine, to enjoy it, but also to be able to finish the wine so that when you're ready to go to the next wine and we start talking about the second wine, you're not like trying to gulp that wine and finish it in order to have an empty glass. Okay, no problem. Martha's there just a few minutes late. Don't worry about it at all. By the way, this is all recorded. Um, so especially if you guys are watching from YouTube, you can pause it, I think, and watch it, you know, like when you're ready. I don't know, actually. I haven't done that on your side, but I'm pretty sure you can pause it and then keep watching it at your own time. Um, but I'll also just do a little bit of prep talk right now so that you guys will be ready. If you have your wine ready, then go ahead, pick up your glass. And um, the first wine that we're going to taste is actually one of my all-time favorite rosés. I drink this rosé every summer. It's the Master Gourgogne uh, rosé, and it is Les Beaux de Provence. And it's this beautiful label here. If you guys can see that on YouTube, if you can see that on Facebook, it is just absolutely a delightful rosé um, from Provence, which is kind of the classical wine region for rosé. And the cool thing about this is that um, it's an organic wine. Okay, good. Alma, thanks. It can be paused. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, you can pause this and continue. Um, and uh, I just think it's so, so delicious, this first rosé, the, the Provence rosé from the south of France. And it reminds me of being in the south of France because it has a lot of those herbs, that herb de Provence, the lavender, the garrigue that you smell in the air there. Um, the winemaker even says that you get some of the mistral, the winds that are going through. And frankly, I just think it's super, super cool that you can get a organically grown and harvested wine where it's hand harvested grapes and you can buy that wine for $15. And by the way, aside from all of that, it's just absolutely delicious, refreshing wine. So this is one of my go-tos every summer. I drink this rosé and I buy it in good quantity and stock up on it. 
So that's one of the reasons why we're tasting this wine as our first one. And then the other two wines, um, if you guys aren't on my email list and didn't sign up for this e for this tasting, you may not know. The other two wines, uh, we're going to taste one from Italy, the Castello di Bossi Rosato, as they call it in Italy. This is from uh, Sangiovese country from Chianti, where they make, you know, Chianti wines in Tuscany. And then the third wine we're going to taste is an El Cotto Rosato from Rioja. So the idea here, too, is that we're tasting kind of three wine regions. They each have their own grape varieties to them. They each have their own culture of eating and the way they do really good eating and drinking and things like that. So we're going to tap into that definitely for our food pairings with each of these. Okay, so now let me pause for a second. I'm gonna talk about a lot of things. So today we're gonna to cover things like um, definitely food pairings for rosé. We're gonna talk about why rosé is so popular now and why it's taken off, or at least in my opinion, why it's taken off. And then we're also going to talk about how rosé is made, the primary methods of how rosé is made, because I always think that's one of the fun uh, trivia questions that I get from people a lot. Uh, if there's anything else you guys want to cover, this is one of the best things about doing a live tasting is that we can have a back and forth. Any words that I say that don't make sense to you, um, please, please, please type them in the chat, write your questions, and um, feel free to also chat with each other in the chat too. I know some of you have groups of people there and others of you are tasting on your own, but this is really meant to be a social place too. I love it in some of the chats. We have people joining from London, from California, from India, from all over the world, and it's different time zones and different things are going on and people will share some of their favorite rosés. People will share some of their favorite rosé and food pairings. So feel free to chime in. Um, and Alma, I don't know if you're tasting, last time Alma was joining us from um, the lovely Bryant Park from an outdoor park. So um, I got inspired since we're doing rosé tasting, since we're doing summer tastings, I'm going to come outside. Um, good. Okay. So your first wine, you want to pick it up. And uh, by the way, if you're not tasting our specific wines because you didn't get those wines or you didn't know about those wines, feel free to get any bottle of wine right now from your fridge, bring it out and uh, from your fridge or not from your fridge and taste it with me because we're going to just do a little reminder of how to taste wine too. Um, so cheers. Sip your wine. Go ahead and sip your wine the way you would normally taste it. And now just kind of register what was that experience like for you. And now we'll go ahead and taste it the wine taster's way. Just a quick refresher for those of you who haven't done it in a while or haven't done it at all, uh, which is to pick up your glass. I usually pick it up by the stem or the base. That way I don't change the temperature of the wine. Swirl your glass. Oh, you're on your balcony. How awesome, Alma. I'm very jealous. Swirl your wine. The purpose of swirling it is to get all the smelling compounds activated. You're volatizing the esters for anybody who remembers chemistry class. And then you're gonna give it a sniff. And you're gonna see. I should have had you smell it still. That's actually the first step, smell it still. And then swirl it and smell it that way and see if you can taste a difference. Before you even start thinking about and worrying about like, oh my God, what do I smell? What am I looking for here? Just take in the experience. Uh, I did a, a tasting or I did a video recently about why it's so difficult to identify wine smells and give it language and describe what it is you're tasting in wine. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we don't come up with specific words. So in the beginning, I would just advise you to enjoy your wine. See if the smell transports you anywhere. See if it recalls any memories for you. Smell is one of our senses most associated with memory. It's very closely tied to memory. So if you're smelling something and you think of a memory, you know, the gentleman I did the video with was talking about how his girlfriend, who knows nothing about wine, smelled and tasted this wine and said, oh, you know what? This reminds me of picking, picking uh, strawberries with grandma and she's wearing her velvet dress. And like just the smell evoked that for her. And then if you looked at the wine they were tasting and stuff like that, there were actual reasons behind that. So um, just kind of let your mind go where it goes and then taste the wine. And this time you're going to suck in some air. And this is because, um, you know, we only taste a certain number of things on our tongue, but a lot of taste is really smell. 
there's no taste receptors on your tongue for cherry, for instance. Uh, that's really a smell. And so when you suck in air, it smells all the flavors, sends all of the flavors of the wine up to your nasal passages, and it allows you to experience the wine more intensely. And I just, I love doing this. I find when I taste a wine that way, I just get so much more out of the wine. There's more kind of, uh, more that I'm sucking out of the wine. I'm getting all the goodness of the wine out. And then you can also just pay attention to the finish. Like how long does it linger with you? Is it pleasant for you? Uh, the top question I always ask myself when I'm tasting wine is, do I like this wine? And then if the answer is yes, or if the answer is no, the, the next question to ask is, well, why? What do I like about it? And what don't I like about it? Um, and this is where our live chat back and forth, we can use this to come up with specific descriptors for what you guys like. So that way you can take that away and apply it for the next time you're at a restaurant, the next time you're in a wine store, you can better navigate that place and find more wines that you'll love because that's really the purpose of all of these tastings. So you're going to get some of the classic things out of a Provencal rosé in this wine. Like I said, I'm getting some herbs. There's definitely some, some lavender to it too. Um, and then there's also like a really nice bright fruit. I don't know if I'd call it cherry or strawberry, but these are some of the words that come up for me. Uh, and then if you taste it, you're probably going to get a good amount of that acidity, um, which is the tartness, the pucker that you feel on the sides of your mouth. Um, and this is a good sign that it's a, a French rosé, um, and you'll find it with a lot of rosés. We'll probably find it in the next wine, too. So that's our experience of the first one. I'm going to go on and I'm going to start tasting the second one so that if anybody only has one of the wines, uh, which, of course, if you're tasting on your own, maybe you only wanted to buy one of the wines, that's perfectly fine. By the way, after the tastings, I also send you tips for what to do with your leftover wine. Um, but one of the best tips that I give people is, aside from saving it and drinking it the future nights, is you can freeze it in ice cube trays and then uh, use it to cook with. I think that's a really good idea. Um, so this is the Castello de Bossi Rosato um, from Italy. This is a great, I picked this one because it's a great um, Chianti producer. I love their, their Chianti. Again, it's really reasonably priced, um, pretty well distributed, meaning uh, I'm hoping that a lot of you, regardless of what state you're in, are going to be able to find it too, or at least in the summertime. It doesn't have a very long run, I find this way. Uh, and so this is primarily Sangiovese, which is the grape that they use to make Chianti. And then I think it's about 30%, oh yeah, it's about 30% Cabernet Sauvignon too. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that it's made in a different method than our first wine. So Rosé, you know, both pink wine, you'd think they're all generally made the same way, uh, but they're not. The first wine was made in the tea bag way, I'll call it. Uh, the technical term for it is maceration, which means that they take the skins of the grape. The skins of the grape, by the way, are what give the wine its color. And they take the skins and they kind of use it as a tea bag and they keep the skins in contact with the juice from the grapes for a short period of time. And then they go ahead and they ferment the wine normally and they make it from grape juice into wine. Now, that's the first way. Uh-oh. Sorry, I guess that's one of the problems of doing it. Uh, the Facebook Live on my phone is we get interrupted by phone calls. But YouTubers, you don't have that problem. Um, so that's one way of making rosé, the tea bag method, or we'll call it maceration. And then the second way is something called saigné, which in French just means blood. And it's like you're bleeding off the wine. In this case, you take um, you take grapes, red grapes, or black grape varieties, and you press the grapes and you're going to make a red wine, but in order to make the red wine more concentrated, they want to take off some of the, what's called the free run juice. The juice just runs off at first and they want to remove that from the wine. So the wine left over becomes even darker and more intense uh, because this is a style of wine that's very popular these days is really dark, dense red wines. So what do you do with that juice that ran off? That was the free run juice. 
you make it into rosé. You make it into a saigne. And you know what? I'm going to type that word because I know with these French words, they're not always... Uh, they're not always very um, intuitively spelled. Uh, and that's the way they make this rosé. There's actually a third way you could make rosé, and this is what people always think is happening, which is you blend red and white wine, right? Isn't that how you make rosé? Well, usually not. It's usually not allowed in most countries, except for, and this is why I mentioned the piece of trivia, the one place that is allowed is for um, champagne. In the region of Champagne, if you're going to make a pink champagne, a rosé champagne, you may take red and white wine, still wine, blend it together, make a lovely pink wine, and then you can ferment, or you can, yeah, put that under a second fermentation, and that's where the bubbles come from, and that's where you get lovely rosé. Uh, which brings me to another point, which is that a lot of people think rosé is sweet, and you guys are probably picking up on this if you haven't already started tasting the Castello de Bossi. Uh, these wines are not sweet. These are perfectly dry. Um, and that leads me to one of the reasons why I think rosé is becoming so popular. But first, let's take a sip of this Castello de Bossi rosato if you haven't. Mm. Oh, it's so good. Gosh. I love it when the wines are so good. This is such a treat for me. I never really have three wines open at the same time, especially three rosés. So just to give you guys a little bit of a, a difference of the two, the two colors are pretty similar. Um, you will see there is a style of rosé that we're going to get to with the third one, where it's a much darker color. Um, but these two are on the paler side. The second wine, though, um, because it's got the Sangiovese and the Cabernet Sauvignon, whereas the first one was Grenache, um, it is a much more intense, bolder wine. Uh, Martha, I don't know if your group has the um, all three of these wines because you have a group of people, so maybe you were able to get all three wines. But you'll see when it comes to that one, I mean, this is like packed with cherries and maybe even some tobacco and cedar and things like that. But it is just like a mouthful of flavor, um, just much more intense than the first one. The first one, I would say, is like perfect sipping wine versus the second one really gets to be much more serious rosé. Ah, and that reminds me, I was going to tell you guys about why I think rosé has become so popular, or at least why I love rosé so much, other than the fact that pink is in, uh, is that it's kind of the perfect combination of wines, especially for the summertime, although I drink rosé year-round. You have the beautiful um, complexity that comes from the skins of the grape that usually you only find in a red wine. So we talked about how red wine is made when it's uh, pressed and fermented with the skins of the wine. That gives it its color, but it also gives it a lot of flavor and complexity. And when you have a white wine, they actually remove the skins off the wine and they just ferment the juice. And so you're missing that extra dimension of flavor that could have come from the skins. And so rosé is kind of the perfect combination of those because you get, sorry, Brooklyn, car alarm. <laughs> you get, you get the um, complexity of the red wine, but it's not heavy the way a red wine was, or it's not like full of so much of the tannin and you get to chill it. So it gets the benefit. Maybe this will be my last outdoor tasting I do, but it gets the benefit of having uh, the chill, and you get the benefit of that because you get to have a lovely summer wine that has just a little bit more of something interesting going on than your average white wine, which I think is cool. Maybe it'll go away soon. Probably not. So that's the Castello de Bossi. You guys, let me know if you have any more questions about that. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to tell you. This one is for about $20. The first wine, the Masta Gorgonje, uh, I bought it for $15. So then we'll go on to our third wine, which interestingly enough, and I didn't plan this, although I wish I could say I planned it. The third wine is Alcoto Rioja. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 
at some point it just becomes comical. Uh, I'm just going to get closer to the microphone so at least you guys can hear me louder than it is. Hopefully it's not as loud for you as it is for me. And so I promised you guys this one has a little bit of a darker color to it. Almost looks like a watermelon Jolly Rancher to me. Maybe that's why I like it. Uh, it doesn't taste like watermelon Jolly Rancher though, I assure you. And this is Rioja. So it's also Grenache, which was what our first wine was. Um, only in France, they call it Grenache. And in Spain, they call it Garnacha. So that's the primary grape. And then let me see anything else in it. Oh, there's also some Tempranillo, which makes sense because it's Rioja. And Tempranillo is one of the grapes that they have in Rioja. So this wine, you can smell if you're not already smelling it. Okay, good, Sam says it's not too bad. You can hear me great. Yay, glad to hear it. So this wine, oh, I love just comparing the smells of all of them. So this one, now going back the second one, the Chianti has like a really berry, berry goodness to it. The first one still has all of its herbal qualities. It's almost like, um, I don't know, like a very lightly scented perfume. And then the third one, the third one, gosh, what can I say about this one? This one's a little bit um, sweeter smelling, but then it also kind of has like a beef jerky thing going on to it a little bit. I think so. <laughs> and I don't mean to make that sound like unappealing because it's actually like it smells yummy. It smells inviting. It smells like I want to taste it. Yay, Carl, I'm gone. So that is actually not too sweet. I was expecting it to be a little sweeter. In past years, it's been a little bit sweeter. Um, but I did choose this one, the Alcoto, for those of you who do like a little bit of sweetness. You like it especially in your rosé in the summertime, if you're going to have a picnic wine, if you're going to have a lunchtime wine, poolside wine, any of those things you like to have it be um, a little bit sweet, then I chose that wine for you. So hopefully you're enjoying it. And the first two, the first one, by the way, I especially love the Master Gorgonier de Provence. I love to have that with a light salad, um, fish, especially white fish. Think any sort of Mediterranean food. The second one, because it had much more of that intensity to it, you could actually have that with something like a steak if you wanted to. You could have it with um, pork. You could have it with grilled mushrooms. You could have it with a lot of the typical things that you have a red wine with because it would certainly stand up to that. But let's say it's a really hot day like we had in New York today uh, and you don't want to have a red wine because it's just too hot, then this rosé is your absolute perfect companion for it. Whereas the third wine, because of that little bit of sweetness to it, um, I really think it's just such a perfect picnic wine. If you've got like an assortment of cheeses and meats and things like that, it would be really delicious. It would also be delicious. Um, it would be delicious with some barbecue um, meat. I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't do it with something like as heavy and uh, as a steak, but if you had some like barbecue sauce, chicken or tofu or whatever it is, you could um, definitely, definitely have this with that. And this one is the price point of $10, which I think it's such a steal for that. I will say I definitely taste the price difference in these. Um, for those of you who aren't used to like, well, what does different price get you? Uh, because it's kind of silly to just say, oh, if you spend more money, you get better wine. That's not always true. Um, but I think what you do get with more money in wine is you get more complexity in the wine is one of the things you'll get. Um, and I definitely see a difference. This one is delicious and lovely and quaffable, but it is more simple. It's just kind of a, a drink and enjoy wine. Um, and then as we went up the price ladder, we were getting more layers of complexity to the wines. So there's like, and when I say complexity, it's kind of like, uh, there's a lot more I could say about the wine. I could sit and describe it for a longer time. There's, there's more to talk about, more to taste and smell. So we talked about the, the ways that you can make rosé wine. And this third wine is made in a blend of the two days, the two ways. So it has some of that tea bag maceration um, wine to it. And then it also has some of the free run Seigne wine too. 
Okay, so we talked about how rosé is made. We talked a little bit about um, its popularity. We talked about the food pairings also. So the only thing that I also wanted to mention to you, although especially for for Martha's group, I want you guys to hop on and um, ask any of the questions that you guys have in the whole group because I know it's sometimes tricky when you've got a whole group of people and you guys are all talking and then I'm on here and you're like, what did I miss? What did I miss? Uh, so the important thing for you to know is that just taste the wines and enjoy them. I think you, I gave you some food pairings to taste, but you'll taste through each of the wines and then just talk amongst yourselves about what the similarities are amongst the wines and also if you find any differences. Um, and I'll send you guys as a follow up to this, I'll send you the notes that I had about each of the wines that I mentioned so that you'll have that. And for anybody who's watching, if you're not on my email list, I'll drop the link here so that you can get the follow up notes to this tasting. Um, but you can also get on my list so that you'll know when I have upcoming wine tastings and you can sign up for those and you can taste alongside me live. So the last thing I want to mention is, oh, two things. Okay. One thing uh, is that, I don't know about you, but for me, this is a perfect social media moment. So take a picture of yourself, take a picture of yourself drinking your wines, take a picture of yourself with your friends, take a picture of yourself, maybe in front of the screen, whatever it is. But if you would, I would love it if you take a picture of yourself, add it to your Instagram stories or whatever, and tag me in it. Uh, my handle is Dini Vino Graham. I should probably take that for you guys. Dini Vino Graham. And let me know. Um, let me know when you do your tastings. Oops, I put a space in that. Dini Vino Graham. There you go. Let me know when you do your um, tastings and things like that and tag me in these because I would love to know what you guys are all doing. And it also helps me spread the word so that more people can join these in the future. And then the other thing I wanted to point out to you is that the vintage of all of these wines, which is the year on the bottle of wine, um, and that represents the year that the grapes were ripened or the year of basically the important thing is what were the weather conditions during that year where the grapes were on the vine. So it's not necessarily the year that the grapes were put into bottle, although usually it is the same year. Um, so that vintage for rosé wine should usually be something recent. So in this case, these are all 2018 wines. Um, and that's for good reason, because you really want to have fresh wines when it comes to rosé. Most of us, when we're drinking rosé, are looking for that bright, fresh, uh, just kind of lovely, perfumey quality to them. And so we really want something that is um, fresh and young. I will say that I have had some older rosé, some aged rosés, and they can be lovely too, but they're just a whole different beast. So unless you're quite sure that it's been stored really well and that you like those kind of wines, stick to a newer vintage when you go for your rosé. And I think that's it. Unless you guys have any questions, let me pause and see if you guys have any questions, anything that you wanted to learn about rosé that we didn't already cover. Or at this point, too, if you just have a wine question in general, whether or not it's related to rosé, you could also ask me that. Uh, and know that my next wine tasting is going to be a cool wine tasting. It's going to be all that natural wine. So talk about how rosé wine is a big deal in the wine industry right now. Another thing that's a big deal in the wine business is natural wines, you know, kind of taking off from the whole organic food movement. Natural wines are things that are organic or could be biodynamic or sustainably grown, different elements of being natural. And so I'm going to talk about what that means that the wines are natural and we're going to taste some of them, of course. And I'm also going to help you wade through the world of natural wines to find out which actually um, will be something that you'll enjoy so that you don't end up just with weird wine because I'll admit there are a lot of natural wines out there that are just weird and you might not like them. <laughs> so, and then there are many that are delicious. So sign up on my website, or, um, or through my email list, lifeinvino.com 
and then go to upcoming wine tastings and you can sign up for the next wine tasting. And I would love to know, especially for Martha, you and your group, but anybody else, if you guys have ideas of how I can make these more helpful to you, if you have times that work better for you, topics that you want me to cover. I know someone's requested vegan wine, so I'll be doing one on those. But anything that you would love to know more about, please, please let me know. Um, I do these for you. It's my pleasure to do them for people. And so really what I'm looking to do is engage you on something that will be useful to you in your life. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Cheers. Happy rosé drinking. And uh, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.